What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Student Built Startups Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Stone, entrepreneur and marketing analytics student at UMD. This is episode 19. I interview student entrepreneurs to share their stories and business strategies. Today's guest will speak about ensuring success through prior planning and knowledge. He will be sharing his story and how his education has played a role in it. I encourage you to go check out Midnight Munchies on Facebook and Instagram. I'm excited to introduce you all to the owner of Midnight Munchies, Connor Delisle, aka Mr. Munch. Hey, Connor, super happy to have you here on the Student Built Startups podcast. I'll have you start off by saying hello to everyone listening and sharing one crazy but true fact about yourself. Oh, hello. Good afternoon. Um, one crazy fact about me is one time when I was the student president of my council, um, of my college, uh, which is pre-university in, U- in the UK, um, I was on the local TV uh, news for debating local MPs, which I think would be like senators to the uh, equivalent of you guys, um, for the legalization of cannabis. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. How do you how did you like the experience of doing that? Yeah, it was good fun. I was really nervous. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I asked the right questions and uh, articulated it in perhaps the right way. But nerves did get the better of me. Cool, cool. Well, we'll jump into a little bit of your education and entrepreneurial story. So if you want to share a little bit with the audience about that, including some details about your business, uh, Midnight Munchies, that would be cool. Uh, So Midnight Munchies was started in October 2018. Um, I started it in my shed. And then in the start of May 2019, I managed to secure the lease to a shop. I actually used the last remaining funds of my student loan to get the shop. So it was quite a risk there. But um, I... Um, I used to do jumble sales at like the age of nine and ten, selling my toys and whatnot. I uh, just wanted to make sales. Um, I liked the idea of earning my own money. And then when I was 12, I became a paperboy. Did that for four years. Um, I then started uh, an under-18s events company when I was about 16. Did about six or seven events. So the gap in the market was the fact that there was nothing in my city where I live that was doing any events or anything to keep kids off streets. So I was put into the local newspaper uh, with a head title, um, Entrepreneur Keeps Local Kids Off Streets, sort of thing. So I guess that was the wrangle, but um, did that for a good two years. And then when I was president of the student council, um, I organised uh, a campaign to get a gym for the college. We managed to get a gym. I thought I played a big part in that too. Um, and then I started, obviously, doing business studies when I was about 18. So first year of college i had to reset uh, i wasn't focused i wasn't i didn't have any direction um, and i was very unmotivated and then fortunately they gave me a second chance to reset so i managed to do media studies and business alongside my film studies so i've got a lot of the creativity stuff and now to deconstruct certain bits of media and whatnot uh, from the skills that i learned during those courses and also business is my uh I probably should have done that the first year. I should have probably known that um, I was an entrepreneur at heart, wanting to take risks, wanting to uh, place your bets without any certainty or guarantee that you're even going to succeed. But that's that's what you do. You you place the bet on yourself, on your own ability, and I guess confidence. Although confidence is the opposite of confidence is just no doubt. So I guess if you've got no doubt, then obviously you're just going to succeed. Yeah, that's cool. Sounds like you've done a lot of uh, really interesting things and have set some ambitious goals like uh, getting that gym for your uh, college and um, just taking steps to understand like what you um, weren't really as passionate about and you kind of redirected your path to kind of match where you think would fit you best. So that's cool. Um, So what inspired you to start Midnight Munchies? Uh, Well, I don't look like one because I don't have the dreadlocks, but uh, I'm actually a stoner and I don't drink. I don't like like consuming alcohol. So obviously when um, I am with my friends in a social setting and obviously partaking with my friends, uh, I got the idea, why doesn't anybody deliver chocolate to your door? Because I've always been notoriously a sweet tooth. You have people that are savoury, that like popcorn and crisps, and you have people that like the chocolate and sweets. Um, So I thought there's a gap in the market for that. So I just decided to obviously come up with a brand, got a mate of mine to do the graphic design to uh, get the logo done, um, and had it trademarked, 
Uh, so obviously that builds the brand. Uh, so hopefully, eventually, I'll, I'll get into a franchise. But uh, we're just in the process right now of uh, agreeing two further shop leases. So that'll be two further locations within the HU postcode, uh, which is zip code to you guys, I guess. Um, so within the HU postcode, it's basically uh, the Hull and surrounding area. So Hull is my city. But there is a town just on the outside of Hull called Beverly. Uh, however, that's got a, a higher income bracket area. So there's obviously more disposable income to an extent. Uh, obviously, at the minute, uh, the uncertainty of income might play a part. Uh, might have some differentiating factors or whatever. But uh, th- that's one of the locations that we'll hopefully move into. All right. Cool. I really like how you saw that gap in the market. When I, I saw you, I came across you on Instagram and I was like, that's really, really an interesting uh, kind of uh, move that he, he did as far as um, placing yourself in the market the way you did. I think that was really cool. Um, Thank you. and, uh, yeah, I, th- I think you took a, uh, took a shot at a really great opportunity there. So. Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't realize how busy it would get like, uh, cause obviously right, right now we are very, very busy. It's yeah. Been an initial downturn, but I think it was the, it was the uncertainty of income for most people that basically affected the consumer buying habits. So obviously they're not going to be liable to purchase takers. Uh, but at the minute obviously that's now an essential thing. It's the only, only thing that they're going to be able to spend money on so restaurants bars um, and le- other leisure facilities are now closed so therefore a lot of the money is redirected to essential food delivery businesses mm-hmm. but i guess mine uh treat you as opposed to feed you so you might get a pizza or a kebab or a burger that'll feed you that'll be an evening meal uh, you get your desserts and your sweet treats from me yeah that's really cool i i guess i didn't really think that maybe this would uh kind of almost work out in your favor a little bit Fortunately. yeah you had the stuff in place to take advantage of that. So, so how did you learn about like what it takes to start a successful business? Was it trial and error? Do you learn from school or do you have like a mentor or something? Never had a mentor. Uh, I've had people who have uh, pushed me in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Um, so the head of enterprise at the university of whole business school, um, Paula Goldthorpe, she really gave me some insight uh, into how to basically just do like applications and things like that, you know, for further funding. So um, I was homeless when I was 18, so I was always financially vulnerable from the start of my adult life anyway, so it's sort of like it, it puts you two steps backward, I believe. Um, so obviously I resat uh, an extra year at university as well uh, due to some circumstances. I've now got a child, but we was previously uh, pregnant anyway, and um, that unfortunately was terminated um, uh, prematurely, if you like. Um not in the sense of it, it basically wasn't our fault. Uh, that was that, it wasn't our decision for that to happen, um, and it's sort of. It, it, I think I think my experience, or at least my my knowledge and my skills now, have been learned through adversity as opposed to privilege. So, therefore, I, I guess it makes you a little bit more stronger. I mean, I'm, I'm, I try to paper off the cracks. There are still a lot of cracks there, but you know, uh, there. Are, uh, luckily, now I have people in place that help me in the gaps that I I, I lack. Do you know what I mean? I can't do everything. Uh, so fortunately, I've got friends. I've got people that I now consider family within the business that really, really help me. But um, that guy, the money, money manager for one of the new stores, is sitting just over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's just having the people in place and knowing the capabilities. Um, that's helped me uh, but obviously b- before that I, I actually do a lot of the things that i led during my modules at university because right now i'm doing a master's degree i've done my bachelor of arts in business already um I graduated i got a first in my dissertation as well which i was really pleased with i'm surprised with too because uh, i did that on my business i did that about customer satisfaction so i actually learned about my business from writing about it during my business modules so, for example, I've got um, a module coming up. I've got to do 3,000 words by next Wednesday, which should be luck. Um, <laughs> I've not got a lot of time, um, but it'll get done. It'll get done. Uh, I'm writing about uh, sustainable logistics. So, obviously, one of our main suppliers uh, is closed. So, their physical outlets, like their warehouses, they're, they're shut. So, I've obviously looked a load of money into a delivery. But because it's a delivery, and I have to wait like a week to receive it. That's um, a, a lot of money tied up in a stock I can't turn over and then therefore profit from mm-hmm. or basically make back the cost and then buy more stock. So basically it's, it's looking at basically the, the uh, choices that you've got uh, um, with what avenues of communication with the wholesalers that you have. So, for example, the local wholesalers that are still open, 
all their sweets are now gone because I bought them all. So there's none left. I can't restock from them. I have to wait for these deliveries now, which can be basically will determine whether or not I'm able to supply sweets on any given trading night. We are open seven nights a week. Uh, we are generating, you know, upwards of 100 to 200 pound revenue per hour, depending on the evening. Um, and obviously the amount of staff that we have on obviously dictates our, our staff bill and what proportion of that revenue is to be paid out in wages. And what residual amount is obviously left to pay me, uh, my utilities, my rent, etc., all the other outgoings and overheads that I expect to pay on a weekly basis. Uh, yeah, because uh, I'll be writing about that. I'll be looking at the factors that basically have uh, impacted the business from uh, a perspective of COVID-19. Okay. But pretty fresh. And I'll, I think he'll probably give me a high mark as well, given it's so fresh and uh, so up to date. Because a lot of the reason why you get marked down is if you use um, out of context references or out of date. So, for example, it's like 10 years old or more, unless it's like uh, a fall fact. For example, uh, Abraham Maslow. He was uh, a person that was responsible for uh, psychology and motivation, but I use it a lot to do with the fact, uh, the motivation of the workforce instead. So when I talk about motivation and when, how it affects organizational behavior, management and leadership within uh, any business or organization, I refer a lot to, to him. And then Alder Fair, who simplified the, the theory of uh, human motivation from like a five-tier pyramid you know, like the, the most basic needs are at the bottom, like sex, shelter, um, you know, warm food, those sort of things. And then you basically have to work your way up to like self-actualization right at the top. But I'll defer basically did it to like um, existence, relatedness, and then growth. So growth would be um, obviously knowing what it is you need to do to improve and survive. Whereas existingness is just basically existing. You're not going anywhere. Uh, so, that, yeah. That's how I uh, in- infuse it into my business, and I obviously learn a lot of things during my course, and then apply it. And then, yeah, and it's basically like a two-way thing. Yeah, 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 cool. Went over a lot of interesting stuff there. Really, some great, valuable uh, insights. Um, one thing that I really liked that you said was when you were talking about how you you don't have like everything completely figured out, but you have some some cracks, you know. But you have people to fill in those those gaps that you have. And uh, one of my favorite quotes was from uh, Henry Ford, and he said that you don't have to know the answer to every question. You just need to have a team around you that's able to answer the questions that you can't answer. Exactly. So I, I really like that. And uh, I think it's very interesting what you're writing about, um, about the supply chain and logistics revolving around your your business um, and COVID-19. I think that's a, a, very, a very good topic to be uh, talking about right now because there's definitely some unique challenges going on with that situation right now so it's affected a lot yeah yeah it has so would you say that revolving around midnight munchies are you more focused on like an in-person business like a retail setting or are you obviously right now you're doing a more online stuff because the retail setting isn't really going to be an option but before COVID-19 happened yeah the, the footfall has been impacted massively mm-hmm. uh, we do get a couple of people that do turn up for collection obviously we implement social distancing measures anyway mm-hmm. Uh, but we advise collection is placed online. You can turn up, of course, but you stand at the door, and then obviously we allow you to come in. Uh, but most of our stuff is delivery. But obviously more so from that, um, it's the it's affected the way people pay for their orders. We used to see no less than thirty percent of the income that we generate was physical cash. So we was therefore able to restock the business the very next day with that that cash. However, now people are. The, only 4% of the income is generated through cash. 4%, that is it. It's all online. So 96% of the business is all cards. So therefore, we've got to wait for it because obviously if you order, I mean, you guys have Uber. Do you have Uber Eats? Yeah, um, yeah. Right, so we have Just Eat. Do you know what Just Eat is? Uh, I haven't heard of it. That's that's a first. Just Eat <laughs> is the go-to app if you want to order a takeaway. You're sat at home. That is the platform whereby all the list of takeaways in your local area appear. However, um, a lot of takeaways put their prices up higher on there because Just Eat take a huge commission per sale. Um, so I try have people order from Just Eat because they're always new customers and then therefore convert them to my website, which is direct from us and cheaper. So therefore, therefore uh, meeting the satisfaction of the customer is cheaper. They're getting what they want. Obviously, we're the only service that does what we do. So therefore, we've got a unique selling point. Um, so it's, it's, it's those things. Uh, so... Just it usually has something called a retention rate. So it's whether or not a customer delu- uh, orders again within six weeks of their first order. Now, mine's typically really low. 
the, the reason that I convert them over to our website. So it's, it feels like it's direct from us, although we haven't done the website. Uh, there's another platform called Food. They give you the website in for free, included in that. So they take a small commission uh, per card transaction. I think it's three and a half percent, as opposed to twenty one percent with Just Eat. So they take seven times the amount. Yeah, uh, because of their reach, they have got a very, very you know, arguably oh. beneficial reach. So you can't really question that. But that's why you, you can get around it. You can you can just put your prices up on there and obviously convert them. So the the, the, the increase in price, you can just justify and warrant and say it's uh, it's a Just Eat finding fee if you like. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, that's one of the uh, strategic choices that I've made to basically alleviate the the, the, the commission that Just Eat take off. Because otherwise, we, we wouldn't have been profitable. They was otherwise taking our contribution per unit after you deduct, obviously, the cost of sales and fixed overheads, etc. So mm-hmm. I do really like your approach that you took, though, uh, using that Just Eats to kind of find new customers and then uh, kind of position your pricing so that you can convert them over to your website. I really like that. Exactly. Yeah. Bad deal. Well, we're about halfway through the episode now, so we're going to take a moment for a brief advertisement. Hey there, you're listening to the Student Built Startups podcast, so I'm assuming that you like listening to things that provide great value. Well, I'm going to fill you in on a little secret that I've heard of recently on how you can get some more free audio content that'll bring great value. Audible.com is a huge library of awesome audiobooks. And the best part is that your first month is free and you get to keep the first book that you order 100% free. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity. You can get your free one-month trial and free book at audibletrack.com slash sbspod. That is audibletrack.com slash sbspod. The link is in the show notes. Now it's time to get back to the episode. So for you, what's the most rewarding part about being a business owner and an entrepreneur? Entrepreneur, I have obviously reviews and things on the Facebook page. Um... And when they, when like the customers post photos of their children that have obviously uh, it's made their lockdown. So when I'm getting sold that, I'm like, re- I'm really happy that my service is actually filling a gap in someone's life, I guess. So again, it helps with the position from a business perspective, but from a moral perspective, obviously I'm, I'm a dad, I'm a, I'm a kid at heart anyway. So and I've got a kid. So, you know, I'm literally like a, a big kid in a, a sweet shop because I own it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, I, that that's rewarding for me. Um, I guess the financial success is is good. But obviously, when it's bad, it's also bad. So it, it's, it's rough and it's smooth. It doesn't really matter to me as long as it's surviving, it's sustainable, and it's people and income. Uh, pretty sure my my staff get paid before me. Um, and if the company has a deficit, I don't know. Maybe the the revenue's gone down, like it did do over Christmas, like it did do um, with the first outbreak of like the lockdown and the initial uh, measures implemented um we saw an initial downturn so the residual amount oh, at least the deficit sorry um has, has actually covered by my wage so i didn't earn anything for a good four weeks which meant i was in financial hardship uh, I compare my rent compare my bills that sort of thing but now obviously it's better so you know it, it swings and roundabouts but you, you you need to be you can't control things obviously out of your control you must basically do what you can with the resources you have and the access that you've got to make the best of it so you can have a capitalize on it or you can compromise on what's going on now come up with a route or direction that's suited to your needs and are you capable are you capable are you able to overcome it yes no do you fold no no you, you embrace overcome adapts and just- yeah for sure one thing I really liked was like that when I asked you, the first thing that you like said was like those Facebook reviews and how you were like fulfilled that these people were really appreciative of what you're offering them and that your business made their uh, lockdown. And I think that's important because entrepreneurs like they need to have a, a sense of fulfillment outside of just the financial success in order to keep them going when times are hard. I, I really like that you, uh, you said that because uh, it's just goes to show kind of that even when times are tough, if you have... Uh, a source of fulfillment that it gives you what you need to keep going purpose yeah yep meaning of life Mm -hmm. so i really you talked a little bit about your target market or your niche um but how did you kind of come up with that and kind of find that gap in the market uh well everyone likes food everyone just likes food it's as simple as that you don't have to be obviously i'm a stoner so 
I know that the part of, a segment of that market would be stoners, but there's also obviously kids, people like the fact that a young guy, um, a young guy that's got a young dad, if you like, has got a motorbike and delivers sweets on his motorbike to your door. You know, they, they kind of like that quirky aspect of it. Uh, it appeals to them, it appeals to parents as well for when the kids go to bed. You know, I do all different types of deals of the day that, that cater for different um, different uses of it. So, Mad Movie Mondays, Parent and Chill Tuesdays, Binge Watch Wednesdays, Gamers Throne Thursdays, you get the idea. Fit Fridays is for um, fitness and theory, that's the one at cheat night. And then you've got Super Student Services Saturday and Sunday, you get 10% off with a student ID. If you're in the police, fire, ambulance, or and paramedic service, or if you work for the NHS um, or armed forces, um, and even SIA, which is Security Industry Authority, so I used to be a doorman. So I give all the people that have door licenses ten percent off as well. So all right, catering for all that. Cool, cool. Sounds like you've uh, done some interesting things to differentiate yourself from other competitors. I'd say that's pretty cool. Um, did you say you had somebody that delivers candy on a a, a dirt bike? Was it? <laughs> Yeah, that's me. I've got a motorbike. Like All right, that's pretty cool. I could see why people would uh would would find that kind of fun. It's the logo. Okay. Um. So, what was your biggest fear when you were starting up your first business, um, or Midnight Munchies? What was your biggest fear um, about that? Uh, failure, failure. But uh, I've learned more from my failures than I have my successes. So that doesn't scare me. Tomorrow's another day if it does happen. Yeah, because I mean, if you if you fail, it's 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 not really a failure because you're always going to learn learn from them. Exactly. I mean, I've, in life, I've had nothing. Now I've got something. I'm not too fussed if I'm necessarily going back to nothing. You know, I've still got my son. I can still see him. I just need ways and means to obviously pay for my life with him. But uh, that, that's about it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's always to yep. fall back on. So. How have you used some good management and operations practices uh, to help grow your business? So. Uh, when the demand increases and obviously we sell out with the goods that we've ordered in, we need to order more. So I recently have implemented a 40% increase on the quota that my dessert supplier gives us. So I think we were previously doing like, I don't know, I'll say one of the stock is a Kinder Bueno cookie. I don't know whether you've heard of Kinder Bueno, but we do a Kinder Bueno cookie. Uh, it costs £1.50 or it's two for two fifty, saving of 25 p on each one. Um, but say, for example, they're, they're the most popular cookie. So instead of getting 20, we'll maybe get 30 or something like that. Um, and we get two deliveries a week. But now I'm going to start doing it whereby they do it on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And they do a big, big order on a Friday. So it lasts until Sunday because we just sell out. I mean, we've got maybe two or three items out of the 10 items that we offer left. And um, this is for tonight. And uh, Sunday's just as busy as a Friday. So there's that. So we'll see. We'll see, but they're the sort of things that are, so I just change it based on the last week's uh, demand. Uh, I obviously position people in place to meet the demand of how many orders come through it in any one hour. Um, I have key performance indicators for the drivers to meet, so I expect them to do um, three to four deliveries an hour to make it financially viable to even pay the wage in, effect in the first place. But obviously, there'll be a contribution per unit per order and uh, an average spend per customer. If the average spend per customer is higher, then obviously uh, there'll be more net profit or contribution per unit uh, per sale. If the orders come through anywhere between 8 and 10 p.m., that's when the most orders do come through. So I need at least... On, on Last night, we had seven drivers on, uh, but we had seven drivers on between the hours of 9 and 10. But that's the most drivers we had at any one hour. But obviously, we have staggered starts. So I only give a driver a four-hour shift. Uh, but in that four-hour shift, they will be doing a lot. Um, so, like I say, it's, it's, it's about how, when the orders come through. I get statistics of when the orders do come through in terms of which hour they come through. So, therefore, I put more drivers on on the hours where more orders come through. It makes sense to anyway. Um, we've got the amount of staff in the shop to deal with demand anyway. So, we had four members of staff on behind the counter last night. Um, put it this way, when I was first doing this, business it was just me taking the orders it was just me doing the delivery and it was over facebook and instagram messenger and now we've got platforms to take the orders for us so come a long way but you can see how that sort of grows and you've got to implement the changes in the right places in order for it to well for the betterment of it really um, and the chances of success uh, but again don't be complacent because at any time things can change restaurants will be open soon so therefore my revenue streams will go down 
uh, bars will be open. People will be opting for uh, going out and drinking as opposed to staying at home and having takeaway. So, you know, that'll go, that'll affect it too. So there's all these consumer spending habits, all these not habits, because if it change, if things change, then habits change. Simple as that. Loyalty is only as good as its last need. So yeah, one one of the the main takeaways I took from that was that uh, just knowing your numbers and understanding like how your customers are interacting with your business is just vitally important to understanding how you can grow. But then also understanding how. Um, relevant uh, things outside of your business can change what you're expecting as well. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can ensure uh, the success of your business or um, improve the chances of success in your business using good planning techniques and uh, understanding what you're trying to achieve. So what does a good business plan look like and what are five of the most important things that you would say are involved in a business plan? Well, you've got your business idea. Um, and you've got your suppliers, you've got your platform of how you're going to sell it to them, and then you've also got the products as well. Uh, well, you, you can just go through the four P's of the market mix, price, product, place, and positioning. So how does it fit into someone's life? Uh, well, let's say, for example, I don't know, it's a new car. Okay, so what type of car is it? Is it low-end, middle-end, or top-end? Is it expensive uh, Range Rover, or is it, I don't know, um, a family convenient Seat? Uh, it depends on who the consumer is, what level of satisfaction you, they expect from it, what price it's also the quality. Um, but if it's cheap, then obviously you expect the quality to be low, but you expect high quantity of it. So I don't know, let's say, for example, there's a there's a shop um, in the city centre of Hull called Sack It High, Sell It Cheap. And it's literally what it says on the tin. They buy in X uh, directory stock, um, food produce, that sort of thing, and they literally sell it for you know cheap as whatever. Cheaper than wholesale, but because it's like uh, almost short dated, they get it at a cheap price, so therefore they sell it at a cheap price, but they make a decent contribution per unit. Um, or you could go to another food place that might sell, um, you know, really, really gourmet meats, that sort of thing. Um, and that will differentiate. So it completely depends on the industry that you're going into, whether it's labor intensive or whether it's capital intensive or whether it's even machine operated. Um, it could be manufacturing. It could be any different type of industry. Uh, so it's completely dependent on the industry that you're going into. Um, source of the finance, I'd also say that. How are you going to fund it? You can't just go into something without any money. You know, you, you need to... Um, but basically, you need to you need to receive some photo income and then obviously invest it to receive a return. That, that, that That's the simple. It's basic economics, supply and demand. Then you've also got investment and return. All right. Cool. Um, yeah, I really liked how you s- just use the four P's of marketing for that because those are always very important, useful things to think about when you're starting a business. So that's like a chain reaction, doesn't it? So It does. Yeah. So revolving around that, what are some common mistakes that you've heard of, seen, or maybe made yourself around planning uh, a business? Well, um, unforeseen circumstances, we'll use COVID-19 or we'll use the fact that we'll be shut over Christmas if you have a day off. Uh, there's no revenue coming into the business, so therefore it reduces the weekly turnover and obviously affects your ability to pay and set outgoings. It might be wages, it might be uh, stock or uh, stock that's on credit, for example, from a wholesaler, uh, struggling to pay those. So bits that basically are out of your control, but also uh, that you haven't planned for. So you basically need to anticipate them. You need to basically look into the future, but it's difficult to. Uh, so you've just got to always be one step ahead of the curve because if you're not in front, you are behind. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, trying to understand what's what's coming next is a huge advantage in involving in business. Uh, and if you can be ahead of your competitors, that's kind of the most important thing. But yeah, it's it's a tough thing to do. Is kind of like seeing the future, but uh, it's a little bit of guessing, a little bit of uh, research, but it's a very important thing. So we're going to move on to the fast five section. I'll ask you five questions. We'll go through them pretty quick. And then after that, we'll wrap things up. So what is the most valuable class or course that you have taken? Obviously, the most prestigious one is my master's degree that I'm doing now. Yeah. I'll be doing PhD come September if the university is back open again. Uh, but the most important one would probably be by A-level business studies. So that would be uh, in college, which would be, I guess, uh, high school to you guys. Um, but that's where you do. So I did my GCSEs, then I did my A-levels. In my A-levels, that's when I chose business. So that was in my second year. 
because I remember I had to reset my first year. When I decided to do business studies, that's when I started to learn about it and I started to get really interested because I started looking at the numbers and basically the, the science behind the art of the business, I guess. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. That's my level business class. All right. Um, so what is one book that you would recommend? Book. You see, I'm not a bookworm. Uh, I read a lot of articles. I don't actually read books. So articles that I read, it could be on business topics, could be on politics, it could be on certain law changes. Uh, you guys in the US have had a lot of state laws being changed recently in regards to some of the things that I mentioned in the uh, podcast. But uh, I'm interested in all those sorts of things. And eventually I want to be an MP, which is a member of parliament. So again, uh, I guess a senator to or congressman to one of you guys. All right, cool. Basically learning about a wider context of things. Uh, the environment's important to me. Uh, being a dad's important to me. Motorbikes are important to me. <laughs> so I guess it's just the likes and interests of me. But um, I, like to, I like educating myself, so I do read a lot of articles. A book I can't really give you, so I do apologize. But yeah. No, it's all good. Awesome. Do your research. That's what I advise. Um, so what is one business tool that you would recommend? Management. Management. You need to know how to manage it whether it be people, whether it be uh, a project, whether it be uh, just op- basic operations, things coming in, logistics, stock coming in, stock going out, pricing, managing it all, being capable of being self-sufficient. So I'm on my own. I know people that have businesses that have to work with a partner, uh, but I operate in a way by I don't necessarily, necessarily need to rely on anybody uh, unless it's like my staff, of course, but I can do all of the, I can do all of their jobs. Um, without them but if it was if a business was at a like a lowered level of production and operation if you like but they're only in place because of how busy we are if that makes sense yeah i get what you're saying yep makes perfect sense either way it's management that is the key it's being able to uh, look at a situation and take an assertive approach and the best one for the business and all the stakeholders involved i say stakeholders because um, there are people that obviously have a stake in your business, but they aren't actually directly linked to it. And they're not a shareholder, but they might live near the business. They might receive a product from the business. They might be a follower of the Instagram account, but have never even bought from us before. They are still a stakeholder. So you need to be mindful of what it is they like um, and what they dislike, especially. I never put any controversial posts on as such. I do shock tactics, but I don't do controversialness because I'm able to explain myself so it doesn't sound offensive, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Whatever it may be. All right. Um, this next one can be either revolving around your business or personal, um, but how do you schedule your time and uh, plan things ahead? I use my notes a lot on my iPhone. Uh, I'm pretty basic when it comes to organization, so I'll make a list the night before for the next day of what it is I need to do, but I also know there are key events that I'm expecting for the forthcoming week or two. Uh, for example, all my deadlines I've got written in as a list. Uh, I've got them ticked off if I've done them, and I've got the dates of when they're supposed to be due in uh, next to them as well. So I obviously keep close look at that, but it does require me controlling myself to look at it myself. I don't have reminders on my phone for those things. So it's just about being aware, I guess, acknowledging what needs to be done with sufficient timing and then if you haven't got enough time make time uh, there is always one or something that you can do to alleviate the stress or distress that uh, a certain task is causing you if i can't come in for a shift i'll either take hot food off the menu because it's only me that's doing the hot food to an extent at the minute um, or i will have somebody uh, do extra hours or have somebody in to do the shift for me for example if it comes to it it hasn't because I've been working seven days a week, but uh, I have the choices available at my disposal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I like how you said uh, using your notes on your phone, uh, just sometimes keeping things simple is the best way to do it, especially if that's kind of just what feels best to you. So um, last one here is how do you get focused and stay productive when you have a lot of stuff to take care of? Energy drinks. <laughs> right. I've stopped daily consumption at the minute, but uh, I do like a cup of tea. Of course, because I'm British. <laughs> um, but uh, I've had to drink a lot more tea recently to um, compensate for my caffeine consumption. Because if I'm not drinking any drinks, I need a cup of tea. Um, I use those to keep me focused, uh, mm-hmm. as well as obviously my driving motivation. But they're extrinsic things that can help me stay on track. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Intrinsic motivating factors, obviously, the fact that I don't want to fail. 
Um, all I'm not scared of it, but that's 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 like a win-win. So I'm not scared of it, but at the same time, I don't want it to happen. So I like toying with it sometimes. But yeah, uh, that just keeps you on track, uh, and that keeps me motivated. Cool, cool. Well, Connor, you gave some great insights about business, a lot of different things revolving around that supply chain, logistics, operations, management. Um, really glad to have you share your knowledge with everyone listening. Uh, but before we wrap up, what is one main takeaway that you'd like everyone listening to remember? Midnight Munchies. <laughs> All right. And where can we find more about Midnight Munchies? You can go to our Facebook page, Midnight Munchies. It will be the first one that comes up. Um, and then also our Instagram page, Midnight Munchies 2018. We will be creating new accounts for the respective stores that we open in the future. Um, peace and love, Midnight Munchies. Peace out, Mr. Mud. I'm really glad that I was able to share Connor's story with all of you guys. Thanks again for being on the show, Connor. And thanks to everyone listening right now. I truly appreciate your support on this journey. And it means the world to me that you're listening to this podcast right now. If you want to help support the show, I encourage you to hit that subscribe button, leave a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts. I would appreciate it very much. And for all the show notes for this episode with all the links and highlights of everything that we talked about today, you can head over to studentbuiltstartups.com. The link is in the show notes for that. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks again. And I'll catch you on the next episode.